Okay, let's go ahead and get started. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Are you awake? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Right. We have after a big breakfast, an apologetics class. That's a pretty tough <laughs> setup right there for keeping awake. So today we're going to speak about uh, finances. And when we start, Mariana, let me know if I'm going too fast. Because okay. I do speak fast. So, when we started planning on this, it was because we were teaching our families in church, and our single people, what is it that we are supposed to do with our money? Uh, Pastor Iso was saying here, well, some of us are here because we have a lot of money, some of us some others because we want to make money, some others because we're broke. And, and money is a very important topic in the Bible. Money is something that, there are a bunch of statistics that I don't want to mention here because uh, I, I'm not sure how reliable they are, but some say that are, there are about 2,350 different verses that concern with money. I don't need those statistics to know that money is important to God, just as everything else in our lives. When we decided who we're going to teach this, some people said, well, obviously, Mauricio, you have to teach it because you are the one working in business. And that's more practical for you. Well, I said, well, I'm glad to obey and do it, but understand that there aren't things in the eyes of God that are secular and things that are uh, spiritual or things that in the eyes of God are practical and things that in His eyes are just theological. No, everything is theological. Everything has to do with the way we know God and we know who He is. So this is just one more of those things that uh, we're going to speak about. Money and how the people who know God manage that money, how the people who minister in God's kingdom uh, gain that money and spend that money. I was telling some of you who were here that a more attractive title for this message would be probably how to become really rich, right? That would be a pretty good title or probably uh, a pathway to financial prosperity. Or we could probably go with something like seven steps to financial freedom. I made up all those titles, but these are the type of things that entice people to come to a class like that. And I hope I'm not disappointing anyone, but I'm not speaking about these at all. Uh, I'm not going to give you answers about how to increase the donations in your church. I'm not going to give you answers about where your investments are going to yield a better return. I'm going to speak to you and I about something that is applicable no matter in what geographics you are found. It doesn't matter the type of economy that you live in. Is a principle from the Bible that knows no difference in languages or boundaries in geography. We're going to speak about the heart of the matter. What is the real problem with finances? Why is it that in the United States of America, for example, we have every time more and more cases of divorce in couples? due to the fact that they are having financial struggles. How could a nation like this one speak about financial struggles when the net income of the inhabitants surpasses the three trillion uh, dollars? How is it that we have people that are happier in countries where there isn't any money and everything is scarce than people here that are committing suicide for all sorts of issues? Finances are a problem. It is said that studies show that 50% of our time, we devote our mind to think about money. I don't have money for this, or where do I put this money? And sometimes we damage uh, our ship, and sometimes we don't bring glory to the name of God by creating in the members of our churches and the disciples a false expectation that this is what the kingdom of God is about. Sometimes we use financial prosperity as a means to entice people and to ask them to come to church. Uh, I said that because as I was growing up in South America, it was very enticing to me when I would see a leader teaching in a very fine, expensive clothing and suit and parking in a very good, nice car of, of the year and in my heart as a young man, I would say, hey, that's what I want to be. I'm tired of being poor. I want that type of life. Now, I want to make something clear. I don't think God is condemning any pastor that has a good heart 
for any pastor that has an awesome church. That's not the point here. The point is the heart. When we create in the ship the expectation that if they come to Christ, they are going to get the answers to all this. That all they need in life to solve their problems is to get healing in their financial situation. And to that I would like to quote Pastor Charlie. Pastor Charlie used to tell young people like me, uh, this, he said, the promise of the New Testament, son, is persecution and affliction. He would say that all the time. One day I went to his office and I told him, Pastor Charlie, look at how much good you can do because you make money. I want to go and make money. And when I make money, then I can help and do all the stuff that you do. And it brought me right back to earth with my feet on the ground and told me, you're welcome to do whatever God calls you to do. But you have to understand something. In the Old Testament, God promised prosperity to people like Abraham and Isaac, and they were prosperous. And that was a sign that God was with them. But he said, after Jesus Christ came, the promise Jesus gave us was completely different. He said that in this world, we will have persecution and affliction. That that is the sign that we are following Christ. Now, was he meaning that all the people of God are supposed to be reduced and resigned and, and that God rejoices in all these people who suffer poverty and sacrifices? Absolutely not. That's not the view God has from his children. But it is important that we understand that one of the ways we see that we are with Jesus is that persecution and affliction comes to us. And the kingdom of God is not about making people rich. So this is not a class about how to get a new truck or how to become richer. And I know that's not what you are seeking. But we're all going to honor God remembering what he has said he wants in the hearts of those who steward his money. We're going to speak about the faithfulness to God and how uh, he wants us to manage what he's given us. So in John 16, 33, uh, Jesus is speaking about it. These things I have spoken to you so that in me you may have peace. In the world you may have, you will have tribulation, but take courage. I have overcome the world. And then in Matthew uh, 11, 5, 11 to 12, he's speaking about them that they should rejoice when they're persecuted and when they are mocked and when they are uh, persecuted because of his sake for following him. That's what Jesus said uh, all the time. I'm sorry. So what we're going to see today is what is the heart of the matter? What is it that God is truly expecting from us? In our heart. What is it that when he sees and when he gives us something, he expects us to do with it? What is it that it really solves the problem of financial stress? What is the solution that is going to heal the families that are being separated over financial struggles? Well, the Bible gives us an answer for that. God wants us to have a heart of a steward. God wants us to have a God heart that is faithful to him. Jesus is speaking here saying, he who is faithful in a very little thing is faithful also in much. He who is unrighteous in a very little thing is unrighteous also in much. Therefore, if you have not been faithful in the use of unrighteous wealth, who will entrust the true riches to you? And if you have not been faithful in the use of that which is another's, who will give you that which is your own? No servant can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and wealth. Jesus said it. Drop the microphone. Don't debate it. Don't try ever to serve wealth and Jesus. So the first thing that we understand is that God wants us to be faithful servants on everything and that we understand that the only one in whom we put our trust and our devotion, the only one who can become an end in our lives is God. So what he's saying there is don't try. We are idolaters, not, probably not like the people of Israel when were in the time of the promised land where they would adopt gods from other cultures and, and worship before them. But we worship the God of money. And you probably say, well, yeah, you guys do that in America because you're very wealthy. Well, no. There are very poor people who are idolaters of money because they're all the time thinking about how to get that money. And there are very rich people who are idolaters because all they think about is how to keep or get, get more money. So this is not about how much we have. This is a matter of our hearts. The first thing a servant of God understands about the money is that it belongs to God. 
The people of Israel had a problem with that. Once they came from the promised land, sorry, once they came from Exodus, <coughs> uh, God relocated them, brought them through Ezra, and Nehemiah, and Zerubbabel to uh, the Jerusalem. And everything is in ruins. They have been persecuted. They have enemies from all fronts coming upon them. And they're very worried about rebuilding their houses, rebuilding their city, making it beautiful again. And among other things in chapter 2, Haggai, or God through the prophet, is telling them, the silver is mine, and the gold is mine, declares the Lord of hosts. Basically, the message of the whole book was, we've been so worried about your own life, about, and about rebuilding all the material things. Understand that I am your God. And in the same way I was with David, or Solomon, or Abraham, or Jacob, or Isaac, I'm going to be with you. So, he is the owner, and in the context of this chapter, he's speaking about all the nations. He's not speaking only about Israel. He's speaking about all the nations. Everything we have. Everything there is. Every penny that belongs to Bill Gates or Warren Buffett or anyone, Charles Sharp, belongs to God. You've heard probably many times the testimony when Pastor Charlie gave the Lord a huge offering. I understand it was somewhere in the order of $200 million, which most of us would probably never, ever own at all even if we put it all in our bank account without ever spending every dollar. And that day, Pastor Charlie said that he felt really good. He said, I gave a good offering to him. And he always would tell us how the Lord just slapped him in the face and told him, I do not want your money. I gave you that money. I want your heart. I want your heart. Money doesn't impress God. It is our heart and our disposition to obey Him. He says here, even sometimes we are so arrogant about the fact that, oh yeah, I'm so smart for business. Or I, I, I come with these awesome ideas, that's why I'm prospering. But look at what God says. He says, you shall remember the Lord your God, for it is He who gives you power to get wealth. Every single thing we enjoy, every single thing that, that we gain, it's not because we're good, it's not because we're smart, it's not because we're so good at finances, no. It's because God gives us the power to gain wealth. And why? That he may confirm his covenant that he swore to your fathers as it is this day. Basically, God is saying, I made a covenant with you. I promise that I'm going to be your God. I promise that you're going to be my people. Because of that, of that I'm going to give you everything you need to survive. I'm going to give you everything you need to have victory. I'm going to give you everything, everything you need to do what I've called you to do. You don't have to be worried about anything else. So idolatry comes. When we start looking at money as either the reason why we are in the shape in which we are, or the safeguard that is going to save our lives out of the situations in which we are. It is to God that we need to lift our eyes. So the steward of God sees money in the right perspective. It belongs to God. Now, that happens when we know who God is. When we understand that God is a God that is holy, that is faithful, that is righteous, that is perfect, our perspective of money and every other resource we have. <coughs> uh, Paul reminds us of this. He says, For who sees anything different in you? What do you have that you did not receive? If then you received it, why do you boast as if you did not receive it? What is it that we have accomplished that was not accomplished because God allowed us to? I was talking to my friend Julian, that many of you know and heard a couple of weeks ago. And I was on the phone with him, speaking to him about interest rates for our savings accounts. <coughs> you know that we have a bunch of money, but we have a couple hundred dollars that we would like to save <coughs> in the future. And yeah, this bank account gives me this much, and this one gives you that much. And all of a sudden, I'm on the phone, and I'm remembering, my goodness, 12 years ago, both Julian and I were putting coins together to buy a burger in McDonald's because we didn't have money for breakfast. We were walking to work because we didn't have a car. And, and that was in America. When we were in Colombia, we were walking five kilometers to school and five kilometers back because we didn't have money for transportation. And guess what? We were happy people. We never got tax return in Colombia because in Colombia you just pay taxes. And your streets are always horrible. And no one ever sends you a check in the mail saying you pay too much against your tax return. <laughs> and this year, you're going to my wife, hmm, this tax reform, we're getting less this year. Uh, I'm completely forgetting.
forgetting that that has never been something that determines my level of peace or joy. What I should remember all the time is that I've never, ever lacked enough to get to this place and live and breathe and eat and have friends and family. What I should be happy about is that because he's been faithful all along, because I've done nothing to enjoy what I enjoy today, I can trust that he will continue to do it in the future. So, it's all his. It belongs to him. It's nothing. There should be never a shadow of a doubt in our hearts that we're too good, too smart, too shrewd to do business. It is God's deal, and He allows us to have it. Even Pastor Charlie, even Pastor Charlie would tell me all the time, and I mention him a lot, because since I shared a lot of time with him in the, during those 10 years, uh, I, I saw people in, in different countries really lost him after a life like that, a private jet, and, and even doing missions and giving so much to people. And, and he always, always made very clear that we wouldn't go astray thinking that that was what made his life the way it was. He always said, I don't know how to preach. I don't know how to make money. I know how to live life. He was always a person that was worried about people believing that money was the sign of his success. It was his relationship with God that was the sign of success. The second thing that a, a steward understands is that not only that money belongs to God, that money is entrusted to us. And there's a beautiful thing that a God that is so holy, so perfect, so awesome, looks at people like you and I who are so the opposite of everything he is and says, I'm going to trust you with this. I'm going to trust you with this dollar, but I'm going to trust you with this 10 million dollars. That he looks upon us and allow us to participate on the expansion of his kingdom that way is amazing. James 1.17 tells us, Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of life, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. The same way the Lord was with Pastor Victor's grandfather, the same way that he was with every one of the men that were reading the Bible and get inspired, that's the same way that God is to work me. He is faithful to his promises to my life, and he will provide. So it's his money, he entrusts that to us so that we do his will. And we have here that because it is his will, what happened to my view here? There we go. So because it is his money, God is entitled to do with it whatever he wants. Whatever he wants. God has chosen to do what he wants with his money, but he has chosen to do it through us. It's a tremendous privilege. When my when my two boys were about four years old, one of my chores at home is to take the trash out every weekend. Now it's Monday. And my boys would always run to the window and look at me taking the trash out every single time. If you've heard the story before, I'm sorry, you're preachers yourself, so you know how we are. But uh, they would go to the window and just look at daddy taking the trash out. And they just longed for the day when they could do that themselves. They were only four years old. <coughs> and every time I would go and say, Dad, I can do it, Dad. I can do it. My brother, I can do it, Dad. I say, oh, just a moment, just a moment. Well, finally one day I say, okay, let's go and do it. So they came out of that house. They felt the big deal. <laughs> what happened to that? So I took the trash out, put it there, and when I was getting it out, I inclined it. <coughs> they each put the little hands, little hands, that trash could, could have completely <coughs> crushed them to death because it was heavy. But I let them put their hands on that trash can and they thought they were moving it, but I was behind holding it without them being able to see me. And all along they were walking with that hand on the trash can and they were looking at everyone. Look, we are moving the trash can. They learned only after they were older enough that they never did that themselves. It was their father who was behind them holding the load for them. That's the way we need to understand God more. Amen. He tells us, yes, I'll let you put your hand there. Hold it there. I'll let you be part of this. But understand something, son. It is me who carries the love. It is not you. It is not for how awesome you are. It is not for how special you are. It is because how awesome I am and how special I am. So the steward of God understands this is not mine. I have to give it to God. I have to understand that it belongs to him. And the steward of God understands that God gets to do whatever he wants. Therefore, Mauricio and Julian, the two poor South Americans that had nothing when they were in Colombia and now enjoy a great deal of wealth in comparison to their past, should be ready at any given time, in a blink of an eye, to be told, 
You're going back here, or you're going over there, and probably not having a nice car, and probably not having a good work, and probably not having a good suit, because the owner of the money said, I'm going to use it somewhere or with someone else for a while. And we should be okay, because the God that provided all along is going to continue to do it. So, what are the Goliaths of our heart of the stewards? What is it that gets on the way of ministers and couples and people of managing well the money in such a way that it gives glory to God? We're going to see three of them. The first one is greed. We are a greedy people. It doesn't matter how many years we've served the Lord, those things of our human nature continue to battle within us. And by the power of the Holy Spirit, God helps us to put them under His power, under His dominion, but we always experience the struggle of their influence. So we are creatures that are inclined to indulge ourselves. We seek comfort. We want to be ahead. We want to go further. We want to have more and brighter and lighter and newer. So God, Jesus here, is warning us. He says, beware and be on your guard against every form of greed. <coughs> he was just saying, hey, just careful. No, <coughs> be on your guard. What that means is that he's saying, expect to be tempted by greed. Put some guards over the city wall to make sure when that comes, you are ready not to let it take over. You are ready not to let it get in your heart. Be on your guard against every form of greed. For not even when one has an abundance that his life consists of his possessions. And he told them a parable saying, The land of a rich man was very productive, and he began reasoning to himself, saying, what shall I do since I have no place to store my crops? Then he said, this is what I will do. I will tear down my barns and build larger ones, and there I will store all my grain and my goods. And I will say to my soul, soul, you have many goods laid up for many years to come. Take your ease, eat, drink, be merry. But God said to him, you fool. You fool! I just imagine God having that conversation with me. Which, I'm telling you, He needs to have that conversation with every one of us very often. You fool! This very night, your soul is required of you. And now you will own what you have prepared. So is the man who stores up treasures for himself and is not rich towards God. When we think of money all around ourselves, when we allow greed, to come right into the doors of our hearts. This is the way God calls us. This is you fool. You fool. Quit thinking that the money I'm giving you is for just to give you a better life. I give you a better life. The money I give you is for you to continue to work in my kingdom, for you to continue to give so that the power of the kingdom of heaven continues. So greed is a good life. There is greed in, in couples. Uh, let me show you how priorities get changed in marriages and why it is destroyed. There are marriages that dream so much about a certain type of house or a certain type of style of living or a certain activities they want their children to do that in order to afford all those desires that are greedy, they have to have both of them working overtime and no one is ever in the house to take care of the children. That's happening all over this country. And if you go and take your time to study a little bit about these teenagers that are going uh, doing shootings and stuff in the schools, you will realize that in every one of the cases you can trace it back to at least an influence of a house being empty because mom and dad were working all the time. But we, we're showing you how much we love you by working so that you can have this life. And then the words of Jesus are much clearer to us when he says, what good is for a man to gain the whole world if he's going to lose his soul? So we see that that happens all the time. We think that we are here to, to, to gain. And, and ministries uh, sometimes do that. Ministries sometimes want to charge for every single thing that they do, for their preachings, for their books, for their sermons, for everything. And it's not always because they want to extend the kingdom. Sometimes it's because they just want to have a better style of life. And God is telling us that's not the setup that he has. Again, he's not against ministers being prospered. 
He's not against ministers being poor. He's against us putting our trust and our eyes on money, on any other guy. And he says that another Goliath is discontent. When we complain about everything, I'm not getting enough in my taxes. I'm not getting enough in my offerings. These people are not giving enough for this project that we're doing for the new biz building. Uh, it's too cold. I can't wait for summer. It's too hot. I can't wait for winter. We are creatures that are inclined to complain. I'm getting old. My knee hurts. We, we, we live a style of life that is unhealthy, and then we complain because of the consequences of a natural uh, process that happens. So Jesus is saying here, make, uh, sorry, this is here in Hebrews, the author of Hebrews, make sure that your character is free from the love of money. Being content with what you have. For he himself has said, I will never desert you, nor will I ever forsake you. This right here is what God is speaking about. This is all we need. Our problem is not a lack of money. Our problem is not a shortage of offerings. Our problem is that we very easily are persuaded against this statement. That he will never desert us or ever forsake us. He is the provider. He is the one in whom we have to have our trust set. And then finally, selfishness is another one of these Goliaths that we're speaking about. So do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind regarding one another as more important than yourselves. Do not merely look out for your own personal interests, but also for the interests of others. That's a verse that is very popular in the Bible. We probably memorize it and know it. And it's very easy for us to think that way when we are on a line, for example. I see a lot of beautiful displays of selfishness in the line for food when a brother moves away. Say, you go ahead and move first. That's, that's beautiful. Good score on that. But when you think about the money, when you think about the money that you have in your pocket, and you know that person is in terrible need, and you know God is convicting you to do it, then to apply this is more important. When we are down to the last piece of bread, I remember there were times at home with my, I have four brothers, all of us were men, and my mother was alone, my dad left the house, so my mom had to work a lot to feed us. And for breakfast and dinner, we always had hot chocolate made in water, and a couple of loaves of bread, little pieces of bread like this. So it was four of us, and I had a brother that was the mathematician, he, he was very mathematical for this. When my mother was coming to the table with a bowl full of bread, my brother, between the five steps that took for my mom to come from the kitchen to the table, my brother already knew how many breads per head that there were supposed to be distributed. So he would make sure, that Mauricio, you only get four. She's bringing 20, so each one gets five. And as we were eating, sometimes there was one piece of bread left. And I tell you what, there were four men fighting for that thing. <laughs> <laughs> you would see one of my brothers just putting the last piece in his mouth so that he could go to the other. And well, those, were, those were things that my mom could work on a lot. But when it comes down to the last piece of bread, it is very difficult to apply this. I better give it to you. And obviously, I'm not speaking about bread uh, literally, I'm speaking about everything. In the ministry now, is God expecting for us to solve every need of everyone? No, no. That, those generalizations are not healthy. What I am saying is that when we understand that the money belongs to God, that He does with that money whatever He wants, depending on what pocket it is. And He's telling me, Mauricio, you are to take this money from here and plant it there. I need to understand that I have to obey it. And the demand of God for my life might be different than the one with Pastor Eliseo or Victor, Pastor Mauricio. The point of the matter here is that he's lord over that money, and I don't want it. So I need to put other people in front of me. So let me go with some uh, uh, practical steps to kill those Goliaths. How to cast their things. How do we guard our hearts that we don't become people that love money over God, that puts their trust in, in money over God? These practical steps come in the form of trust. It's all a matter of trust in two ways. Trusting God, when we trust His uh, uh, promises, and at least practically speaking, I want to speak about faith and gambling. You know, the difference between these two. Faith is when God has called us to do something that normally feels that it's greater than ourselves, and we go in obedience to that call. And gambling is 
when we really want to do something that we cannot afford, and we go foolishly to that, even though we haven't gotten God's approval to do it. We might call it faith, but it's nothing but manipulation and gambling. We are leading people astray, telling them God told me this, when we are not really convinced that God did that for us. So we have to learn to trust God in a sense that we do what He's told us to do. So money doesn't determine whether I go or not, but what God tells me does determine whether I go or not. There are so many uh, cases just here in America of huge organizations that really it defamed the name of God and the church because they started these awesome attention gathering projects and told everyone that they were evidence of the glory and the favor of God. Then they couldn't afford to operate them and everyone understood that that's what happens with Christians. You see, the fact that I drive a very good car, that I have money in my pocket, doesn't mean that God is pleased with me. The fact that a man is poor doesn't mean that God is upset at him. And sometimes we translate things that way. No, what God wants is a heart that moves in faith. Because in faith, yes, there is going to be time when God tells us, go over this, and we say, God, I don't have money. He said, get it started, and he finances it as we go. But we need to better be sure that we understand that he called us, and not out, out of our own foolishness or our own selfishness. In that, we need to ask and be okay with his answer. Sometimes there are things that we desire. That's not a sin. I, I hope every pastor would like to minister to a greater number of people and probably have more buildings where he can minister to more people. It is okay to have those desires and ask, Lord, do you want me to embark in this endeavor? But if God says no, we should be okay with it. We shouldn't be frustrated with it. He is the owner. He is the one. God is not calling us to be visible. God is not calling us to advertise on billboards how many souls we save a week. God is interested in us making disciples. And that can be done in a mega church building with the power of God and the blessing of God there. But that can also be done with the power of God and the blessing of God in a little garage in Ethiopia. The bottom, of the, the, the bottom line is that it is God who does it, and I need to trust God on that. God, if you don't want me to be the one doing this, it is okay. If you want the church next door to be the one doing this project, that's fine with me. Then, let's trust in God, and we do what He tells us. Then, let God and men trust you. If God were to have an interview, imagine that right now God calls you to His office. The Lord Jesus calls you to His headquarters. You sit down next to the table and he's eyeball to eyeball with Jesus. And he says, I've given you this. You take, I'm sure the Lord uses Excel spreadsheets. He just gets there, gets an Excel spreadsheet and says, look, I've, I've given you all these resources. What have you done with that money? What have you done with all this that I have given you? He said, oh, well, Lord, you know, uh, my children really needed this. Uh, my husband really needed that, and but I did use this for some discipleship programs here and there. Well, if we always spend our money understanding that one day we will have to sit <coughs> down, well, stand or be on our knees in front of him, giving an account of everything, that would help us to manage money better. And guess what? God has given us tools to be accountable, to embrace accountability. God has given us people around us that we can be accountable to voluntarily. Accountability is frowned upon by many people. When pastors come, if a pastor comes to me and tells him, Mauricio, I want to ask you, how is your, ma your mind, young man? How are your thoughts? Are they clean? I can say, huh, who do you think I am, pastor? Do you think I'm all the time thinking bad stuff? Why do you always accuse me of being like that? Or I can say, pastor, thank you for loving me enough. To, for us to ask me the question to see how am I doing in my mind. When a supervisor calls his employee and tells him, hey, you have been coming to work too late and leaving too early. Well, uh, you don't think I can do my job in the time? No, I love you enough to point out if there is something being done wrong here and it's prepared and it's fixing. Accountability is okay. When a pastor makes himself accountable to people that God has provided in his, provided in his church for that purpose, it's not a sign of weakness. It's not a sign of lack of faith or hesitance. 
It's a sign of a tremendous humility and strength. When he had not, yes, he's the pastor. Yes, he's the head. Yes, he gets to make many decisions. But he's humble enough. He understands his humanity enough that he gets brothers and sisters around him and he submits, look, this is the budget. This is the project that I want to do. What do you guys think about that? That is a sign of strength. And that allows God to trust more. God will not continue to give more to those who are greedy, to those who use the money for their own aggrandizement than their ministers and larger. God will do it with the people that understand, I am weak, I am not this good, I need people around me that could tell me about these things and probably get me out of mistakes. A very practical way to do that is to keep your budget. I'm amazed about this. In every class that we teach, about 70% of the people do not have a budget. And that goes the same for personal finances all the way to church finances. Budget, as soon as you say the word, people feel guilty or they want to leave the room right away because they, they don't want that. A budget is a very good way to be accountable. A pastor doesn't have to have an MBA or a PhD to do a budget. It's very simple. If you are not a person, because they, the excuse I hear all the time is, well, I'm not a numbers person. That is a terrible excuse. God has put people in your church, you can ask, would you please make me a list of all the expenses that we go through and a list of all the money that we get in donations or offerings or whatever. Ah, we are receiving $100 in donations and we are spending $200 in our expenses. There is a problem there. That pastor didn't have to do very much mathematics. It's a pastor that now is aware that there is a problem, there is room for prayer, there is room for some adjustments to be made, but a budget is a very spiritual and anointed tool to hold, to embrace accountability. It is as anointed as oil on your forehead, as praying for the sick, as preaching a sermon in the pulpit. It is anointed. And we can be accountable with that, because then when someone has a finger to point at us, we can say, look, this was planned for, this was prayed for, this was not only approved by me, but by many other people. Then inclusion. <coughs> Don't make decisions by yourself. Don't make decisions just to make a statement. Bring other people, bring other pastors, seek elders and say, I'm thinking about that. What do you think from your perspective? Allow that. Include more people. Don't do ministry alone in terms of finances. Then conviction versus ego. We need to remember that we're here to exalt the name of Christ. Our job is to make God known to people, not make ourselves known. We're not here to be in the spotlight. We're not in the show. We're not the ones that have to be in the billboard. Just come and see me and, and I have all these awesome gifts and things. No. It is Jesus that needs to be the center of attention. But sometimes we make decisions based on people. We want to be the pastor with the biggest church in town. Or we want to be the leader with the most soul saved in a campaign. Or we want to be the one who gathered the most funds after a certain uh, uh, fundraiser. And then purpose versus statement. And with that we close. Every single decision that we make that has to do with money or anything in life for that matter should be filtered by our mission and our vision. Different churches and denominations have different ways to word that mission and that vision. But we all know that it's the Great Commission that we're speaking about. The calling Jesus left us was go and make disciples. If the decisions I am making with my money are taking me and my church behind me closer to fulfill that goal, then we go for it. If the decision is not, if that purchase is not taking me in that direction, then it doesn't go. Even the world understands that. Companies, you can Google it and just go on their web pages. Companies have missions and visions. And they make their strategic decisions based on whether those decisions are taking them to their goal or not. So should we believe and understand all the time that our business decisions, our money and financial decisions have to be filtered by obedience to God and by how far they are taking us in the fulfillment of that. Finally, remember, Money belongs to God. We are just those in whom, in His mercy and sovereignty, He decided to entrust money to. And He gets to decide what we are to do with it. Every penny that you might have in your bank account and in mind. Every penny that might be on your wallet or whatever currency in your country you have. 
every single thing we all belongs to him. And at any given time, he can tell us what to do with it. Finally, remember, God is not asking for our assistance. He's asking for our obedience. A poor God, a man of God, is a man who obeys. God doesn't need my awesome plans. He doesn't need my great strategies. They came from him in the first place. What he needs from me is for me to say, yes, Lord, and start walking in obedience from that. Thank you very much. If you have any questions, this is a good time to ask them. And if you not, we're done. The Apostle Paul said to the Corinthians to work with their hand that they might be able to give to those in need. That is right. God gives us all we give. Thank you, Pastor. Yes. Any questions? Thank you.